Hey, good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Great chapel today. Several things we want to uh, say to us. Wednesday, during community time, Mr. Thornton and Mr. Bowling pontificated deeply about the glory of February. Remember, keep your feet on the ground and what's reach for the stars. Is that what we're doing? Bowling encouraged us in that, in that way. There's a couple of other things about February that I want to point out, out that we're going to be celebrating. Um, it's Black History Month. We're going to enjoy celebrating. Yes. It is also coming up, not this Saturday, but February the 10th is uh, the celebration of Asian Lunar New Year, and we want to celebrate as well. Here's the thing, guys. Everybody with me? Shh, shh. Everybody with me? Let's settle in. Here's a beautiful thing. When we think about those two things, we are thinking about two words, imago dei, the image of God. And we are celebrating the increasing diversity among our student body and our community, and we are celebrating the fact that every one of us is created in the image of God with purpose, with meaning, gloriously, beautifully, fearfully, wonderfully made, and we are contributing to the work of His kingdom. And we're going to celebrate that uh, this month, and we're really uh, excited about that. Okay, not this week. Everybody with me? <laughs> it's feeling like Friday. Everybody's just a little... Okay, not this week, uh, this next week, but the week of February 12 through 16. Spiritual Life Week, we've been talking about it a little bit. Dr. Christopher Yohan is going to be with us. And we are all going to be here in chapel every day, Monday through Thursday, worship chapel on Friday. You don't really have a choice about those things. But there are some things going on that we have some choices about, and I want Ben to tell us a little bit about a couple of things that you can start marking your calendar for. Yes, we're really excited about Spiritual Week this year, and we want to let you know of a few events outside of chapels that you should all plan to attend. First of all, on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of Spiritual Life Week, Dr. Yuan will be doing some teaching and Q&A during lunch in the White Chapel. This is a great opportunity to ask questions in a smaller discussion setting. Secondly, Wednesday morning at 8.15 in the library, there will be a student prayer breakfast where we will gather to pray for our student body and community. And last but certainly not least, there will be a worship night on Thursday night at 7 in the White Chapel. The worship team from Gospel Life Church will be leading us in a special night of worship and prayer. And they will be back on Friday to lead our worship chapel. Thanks, Ben. So we're really looking forward to a great week. But for today, we're super excited for chapel and grateful to hear a message from our very own Rebecca Schulenberg. <laughs> Rebecca, she is a soccer player here at WA, who I've had the joy of being a teammate with. Last semester, she took a expository preaching class and she, she wrote her message in that class that she's going to be speaking today. I'm looking forward to hearing from her, but for now, let's all stand together and sing. Now it's buried beneath my shame And who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb Till I met you And I was breathing but not alive And all my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you You called my name Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave 
into your glorious day. But chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you called me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future. My eyes are open. Cause when you Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Cause he's never let me down He's faithful through generations So why would he fail now? He won't He won't I've still got joy in chaos That makes no sense So I won't be going under I'm not held by my own strength Cause I built my life on Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful in every season so why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. He won't fail. He won't fail. Rain came and wind blew, but my house was built on you. I'm safe with you, and I'm gonna make it through. Rain came and wind blew, but my house was built on you. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything
everything around me is shaken I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus Cause he's never let me down He's faithful through generations So why would he fail now? He won't He won't He won't fail bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Lord, thank you for today. Um, I thank you for a wonderful week. Um, please speak through Rebecca. Tell us the things that you want us to hear. And I uh, pray that we have a wonderful rest of our day and a wonderful weekend. Amen. Hey guys, my name is Rebecca Schulenberg. If you didn't get that from my many introductions. But I will be preaching the word that I wrote a sermon on in preaching class with Mr. Hogan last semester. Um, oh, thanks guys. <laughs> I'm going to start off with a question. How many of you have asked God for something, specifically to take something out of your life? Sickness, disease, injury, any thorn in your side that is making your lives challenging? You may plead with the Lord to take that away from you. In January of 2022, my aunt received the news that she'd been diagnosed with multiple myeloma cancer. This is a cancer that forms um, plasma cells that build up in the bone marrow of one's body and forms tumors in the bones. Um, two months prior before she got diagnosed, she had given birth to her firstborn baby girl, Kylie Joy. And for years, my aunt had been praying about having a baby. So honestly, she was just a miracle child. Um, she had many miscarriages, but this made the news strike even harder because my family took in Kylie while she had to go on a journey that wasn't an easy one. She was confined to her home, had to go on multiple hospital visits. She was unable to walk, not able to move very well at all. The doctors didn't know if she was going to be able to walk again. My parents, who are the most self-sacrificial people I know, took in Kylie, took care of her um, while she was going through this really painful journey. Um, well, I had just transferred here to Wien Academy. It was my second semester of my sophomore year. Um, I loved having Kylie around all the time, but with the buildup of everything going on, I was just lonely, depressed, uninvolved with school and just in general. Um, and on top of that, my parents and I drifted apart, and that was heartbreaking for me because they were the only steady things in my life through transferring, my sister going to college, drifting apart from friends. I remember coming into Wien Academy and Mrs. Ball asking to meet with me to see how my first semester was going. And I came in, was gonna finesse that, say it was great and get out of there. She asked me how my teachers were. I said, fantastic. She asked me how the students were. I said, amazing, all of you. Um, but then she asked me about my family and my aunt, because she had heard. And then about like three minutes in, I started crying, which is not normal for me to do at all. I don't like crying in front of people, especially people that I've just met. But she did reassure me that it was more normal than I would think. So if you've cried in Mrs. Ball's office, or you want to, or you need to, don't feel ashamed, because I just publicly announced it to the entire school. <laughs> um, but that's when I realized, wow, I am in deep struggle right now. Um, and so I pleaded with the Lord. I've been pleading with the Lord, my family, Everyone who knows my aunt, who heard about her story, has been pleading with God to take this suffering and her cancer away from her. And today, we will be focusing on the Lord's response to Paul's weakness that he pleaded to be healed from. Just like we pleaded to be, for my aunt to be healed from her cancer. The Lord responds to Paul's pleading by saying, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Many times we get angry with God 
if he doesn't answer something the way we want him to. And if he says no to one of our requests, we can get discouraged and feel defeated by our own earthly struggles, consumed by what is on this earth rather than what's above. So why does God say no? And how do we respond to suffering? The passage we will be looking at to answer these questions is 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. It reads, To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in my weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul's writing to the church of Corinth here. They were an extremely immoral culture as they worshipped a false pagan god. And he came into this ungodly city and planted a church, which grew to be a stable congregation. In 1 Corinthians, Paul dealt head-on with an issue involving compromised believers. Um, as anticipated, they didn't take this news very well and were inclined to believe that Paul wasn't really an apostle after all. So he sent Titus to restore truth and order. And once he received the news that the Corinthians were back on track, he writes a sincere appeal to them, which is 2 Corinthians. And throughout the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul is defending his character because it was previously questioned. And Paul is someone who has experienced great suffering and persecution and opposition in his ministry, more than most. He talks about that in chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians. In this passage, he talks about a thorn in his flesh, a personal weakness. Verse 7 says, To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. At the beginning of chapter 12, Paul tells of an experience of being called up into the third heaven, an experience in which he's not allowed to talk about. Paul refrained from speaking about his experience because he didn't want the glory of a supernatural story that's unverifiable. We don't know what for sure what Paul did see. He may have seen what eternity would be like and knew things that we couldn't know. Whatever it was, it would be used purposely because it gave Paul a lot of confidence to preach the gospel. However, it was possible that because of this knowledge, he could become prideful and arrogant, thinking of himself greater than others and more worthy of preaching the gospel. Because of this, to keep Paul from becoming conceited, he was given a thorn in his flesh, a personal weakness. Although there is no exact identity to Paul's thorn, it could have been an eyesight impairment, illness, physical weakness, maybe something emotional, like persistent temptation to sin or depression. Whatever it was, it was hindering Paul from his day-to-day -day life. Paul says in verse 8, Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. The first thing Paul does is cry out without blame. Hearing Paul's plea, the Lord promises him, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. He is promising to demonstrate power in Paul who is weak. The Lord delights in taking human weaknesses and using them for his good. And Paul responds to this in a fascinating way. Instead of continuing in his pleading, he says, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul's accepting here that when he's least reliant on himself and his own resources, he's most powerful because he must rely on God. Paul listened and waited for a response from God rather than looking for a response that was convenient to him. He recognized the Lord saying no is something good. And that's the big idea here. We must recognize that the Lord saying no and allowing our suffering is a good thing. It's a blessing. It draws us near to God. Like Paul, we should gladly boast in our weaknesses, hardships, and difficulties. The first point to be made from this passage is to cry out to God without blame. Paul cries out to God three times for him to be healed. It's not a bad thing to make your request or pronounce your worries to the Lord. In fact, he wants you to do this. Jeremiah 33, 3, the Lord proclaims, Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. 
In Philippians 4, 5 to 7, Paul writes, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. God is reminding us of the importance of prayer and that we can be in his presence at any time. However, that doesn't mean he'll answer a request in the way that you want him to. He will use our experiences for his glory, not for our own pleasure or good fortune. Yet we can't blame God for our sufferings. Many times Christians think because they are Christian, they won't experience pain or suffering. Yet we have to understand that's a part of human life. The Lord's plan was not for the world to be sold under sin and pain. Yet some people choose to battle against God for the way things are going, instead of accepting the reality of pain and suffering. Don't blame God. Call to him. Which brings me to my second point to be made from this passage. Listen for his response rather than looking for your own response. What that means is you must open your heart and mind into what the Lord is trying to tell you rather than what you want him to tell you. Which is pretty hard to do. Because when you pray to God, you already have what he wants, what you want him to tell you. And constantly I'll have to do this when I obsess over worldly things. Soccer, fantasy football, regular football, and the Chiefs going to the Super Bowl. Winning, just anything that's important to me. One time I broke a special family ornament, and my brother was furious with me. I don't know if he had some sort of emotional attachment to that ornament, but I was scared that I was going to get in deep trouble with my parents. But my mom simply told me, it's okay, Becca, you can't take it to heaven with you. And that opened up a new perspective in my mind on what I viewed as important versus what God views as important. Paul understood God when he said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. He understood that as a clear no. When the Lord says no, how do you react? I know when I was younger, I didn't respond well to the no. And I don't think any child does. A couple weeks ago, I was babysitting Kylie, and she really wanted M&Ms, as she always does. And I had to say no, because she had M&Ms earlier that day. And she just started crying and wailing, throwing a fit. And then I really couldn't say yes, because that would be positive reinforcement of a negative behavior. Mr. Bowling, where are you at? AP Psych. <laughs> but my cousin didn't realize the bigger picture. She didn't realize that she can't just be on a diet of M&Ms her entire life. Kids don't understand why they're being told no, so they give the adult grief. Think about the grief that we give God when he tells us no. God telling us no is not a weakness. His no is always merciful, even when we don't understand the bigger picture. He is all-knowing, and we are not, and we have to understand that. God said no to Paul because his grace is fully capable of providing everything Paul needed to endure his suffering. God can take something bad in your life and turn it for his good. In fact, Christ's power becomes most obvious where believers are weakest. We will be able to see God working in our lives if we choose to listen to God's response rather than looking for our own. Listen rather than look. And a third final point to be made from this passage is to view weakness as a good thing. Paul responded to the Lord by saying, he's now going to gladly delight in his weaknesses. If we allow God to take the wheel in our lives and throughout our weaknesses, he could accomplish so much. The most amazing example of this is the work that God did through Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 13, 4 says, For he, Jesus, was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. God loves to use what the world considers weak to shame the powerful. But for Christ's power to work, we must be in full submission to him. We must let him in. And we must also realize that our interpretation of good is different than God's interpretation of good. Our good is easy and simple. God's good is exalting the name of Jesus while working in you an eternal weight for glory. Think of where you would be today without your suffering. I know that I would be pretty different because most of my development in Christ came from my hard times, came from that suffering. I grew closer to God because of it, and therefore I praise God for them. I was listening to a sermon online preached by a pastor named Jack Hibbs, and the title of the sermon was, Why Does God Allow Suffering? 
And he made up a pretty interesting point, saying that we cannot grow spiritually without suffering. He brings up Jeremiah 48, 10 through 12, speaking about Moab. God's word said that Moab had it easy, never had any challenges or problems, specifically saying Moab had been at ease since its youth. He's also been peaceful like wine on its dregs. Goes in to talk about how Moab had never been poured from vessel to vessel, never gone into exile. And consequently, God says, I don't even know who you are. I'm not involved in your life. Which is honestly terrifying to think about. God not being involved in your life or knowing who you are. A life that's full of ease. A life that we desire, that we really want. Paul is saying that he would rather rejoice in these struggles and have these hardships than having an easy life because that's not when he's close to God. Instead of shrinking away from God because of our weaknesses, we must go to him. In Isaiah 40, it is promised he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. God's strength is made perfect in weakness when we put our full faith and trust in him. Cry out to God. Listen to his response rather than looking for your own response. And to view weakness as a good thing. Allowing God to use your weaknesses in ways that will bring glory to him. Weaknesses are a struggle in our day-to-day -day life. Whether we want them or not, they aren't going to go away. So how are you going to respond to them? To put this into practice, next time you're going through something, maybe that's now, go to God, tell him your worries, tell him what you're struggling with, and let him in, let him use you. Many times we'll look to the world for comfort. We look to the things on this earth to grant us temporary satisfaction. But that will only bring us further pain, further longing, further direction towards sin. And we'll get deeper and deeper into it the more we do it, and that will push us further and further away from God. But the Lord is our comforter. He is perfect and all-knowing. Trust in him, for he cares for you. My aunt, who is alive and well today, she's actually here, sitting front row. Shout out to Aunt Jenny. <laughs> She's also on the screen, and that's Kylie, because she's cute. Um, but she continued to minister the gospel in the trenches of her cancer. And throughout the emotional and physical pain she was feeling, she gave all the glory to God. And she's come a long way from two years ago. She, God allowed her to walk, become stronger and healthier. And God gave her an amazing gift with words. She is a fantastic writer. So she would write and post about her experiences through the struggles she was going through. In every post, she would express of God's goodness. And there are so many people that care about my aunt because she's just an incredible person. I'm not biased. But lots of people would read these posts and they would see how faithful she was to the Lord throughout everything. And many people came to Christ because of my aunt and were showed his great love because of her faithfulness. Although weakened, my aunt is the strongest person I know, having humbled herself before God, allowing him to take control over her life. Through this weakness, she was pushed to draw near to God to use him as her comforter. And God worked in my life as well. He used the struggle that I was so deep in as the depressed, lonely new transfer, and he allowed me and shaped me to become a servant of him who's in full submission to him. And I encourage all of you to actively try to give your weaknesses to the Lord. It's not going to be easy. Honestly, it's just an incredible experience to see how he shapes you through them. And looking back at sophomore Rebecca, I'm just so thankful for the spiritual growth and the experiences that he has given me the wisdom to navigate through. But to do this, we must accept humility, be open to challenge, hardships, and persecutions to see them differently as others would. Gladly delight in them as Paul did. Weakness is a constant reminder that you need God, which is a great reminder to have. Allow God to turn these weaknesses into his strength so that his power may rest on you today. Let's pray. Lord, we pray to you today in humility and weakness, for we are weak people, but you are a strong God. We need your strength today more than ever. Allow our minds to focus on the things above rather than the things on this earth, for if, we can 
For if we get consumed by what is on this earth in the temporary, we can get lost and become a servant to our weaknesses rather than you. Allow us to view our weaknesses as good, for they are a constant reminder that we need you, our heavenly perfect creator. Use our weaknesses for your good today and every day to come. In your heavenly name, amen. Have a good day, guys.